Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> okay, buenos dias. Uh, again, we have a very, very distinguished uh, speaker uh, today. Uh, we are a team of architects, husband and wife. Uh, the better half is just now not present. Uh, Mrs. Parul Zaveri and architect Nimish Patel. They run a practice called Abhikram and they've been winners of many national and international awards and most importantly they have been the torch bearer of uh, learning from traditional wisdom as a kind of a formula in the glut of globalization and have been the crusader of objectively trying to understand that what the context has to offer and how can we learn and apply it in back into the same context rather than inventing the alphabet from ABCD again. Can we not pick up from what has been there and reinterpret, reapply and take it further from there. He's also been uh, involved with teaching and they also have uh, a craft tradition uh, set up uh, called uh, Pani. Um, no, no, it's Virasa Foundation. Virasa Foundation. And crafts and technology. Ah, okay. So they've been working with the traditional craftsmen as well. They've done a lot of work in Rajasthan and Gujarat and other parts as well. And uh, going from the basic, taking not only the architectural references, but also of the cultural significance, of also of the master craftsman tradition of building and building with craft. So it's a kind of a holistic understanding and a package and we are very grateful that he has kindly consented to be here Likewise. and uh, <laughs> grateful to uh, enlighten us on some of these attitudes and approaches. Okay. Uh, the speed with which, at which uh, uh, Mr. Pandya was speaking, I suppose, <laughs> is all right with you? I can speak at the same speed or do I have to be slower? This is fine. Okay. Uh, all right. I I understand that you are from him. I understand that you are essentially uh, working with how to add in the to, in the uh, historic settlements. You know, if you were to do a project there, how would you add? Uh, it has been called inserts, it has been called intervention, it has been called many of these and I find a problem with that. I uh, find a problem not because they are not inserts or interventions, they are. But if we call them inserts and interventions, we are not focusing on continuity. So uh, in our practice what we have understood is that whatever we do, is a continuity with the past without fossilizing it and it's a balance between that and a desirable change for the future without making that change incongruent with its contextual surroundings. Now this is a heavy sentence but I wrote that, we wrote that in 1989, two and a half years after we got introduced to uh, what is conservation. Uh, so I just start with I'd like to. First eight, nine slides are about reading because they are sentences very clearly I'll explain of what is our understanding, how do we develop on what constitutes our cultural heritage. Okay? So what's the understanding? That the conservation, heritage conservation, it is the responsibility, we believe, of every Indian. It's not an option. We have to live up to it. The heritage itself and the wide range of background that we all come from 
provide adequate range of roles through which each one of us can make a meaningful contribution to the cause of conservation. Because the thoughts and thinking prevail that conservation is a responsibility of somebody else other than us. That it is uh, institution A, institution B, government C. No, but all of us. A clearer understanding of the issues involved will go a long way in maximizing the utilization of resources. And this presentation is an attempt to clarify one of the perspectives of our cultural heritage, there may be many, its role and meaning in our lives and the needs for its continuity and therefore conservation and the principal issues involved in it. Indian cities with rich historic past <coughs> have survived under complex pressures created by socio-economic, commercial, industrial, and other development activities. But growth of uncontrolled and incongruent activities in the cities have led to the decay and deterioration of its vast cultural heritage. Conservation is the process of reversal of this decay, <coughs> which, if allowed to continue, will certainly result in disappearance of what we call our heritage. Cultural heritage demands continuity and growth brings about change. And there is an international national debate on uh, continuity versus change. To me, this debate is non-existent because growth accepts both. Growth will accept continuity and growth will accept change. So it's not an either or scenario, no matter which way you look at it. The focus of any developmental activity, therefore, ought to be to attempt, this is that sentence, to attempt to achieve a balance between continuity with the past without fossilizing the past. You don't sort of freeze it and then say, okay, I'm pasting it in a century later and I call it continuity. No. And a desirable change for the future without making that change incongruent with its contextual surroundings, that it doesn't stand out like a sore thumb unless it needs to. Okay? And there are few typologies where it needs to. Now when, let me start with the process. I am a 65 entrant <coughs> to the SEPT University, fourth batch. My wife is 68 entrant <coughs> to that university. I went to US to do my master's program, which allowed me to study on Ahmedabad city. And we were all from developing countries learning about housing in developing countries. Finish, after finishing our studies, <coughs> Parul, my studies, Parul went and worked with architect Paolo Soleri, if you've heard of him, mm -hmm. in Arizona. First at the construction site and then at his office. We then traveled to Nigeria. We thought we'll go to a developing country that has money before <coughs> returning to one that didn't have money. And in 1979, India was not flush with money or as flush with money as it appears to be now. We realized that development got has nothing to do with money. Attitude has. That money is not, money may be a tool but it will not ensure any development after spending two years. We returned to India in 1979, uh, in August, very clear that we would start our own practice because we did not agree with so many things that and so many other practices that were going around at that time, pursuing what was known as modern movement in architecture. Modern movement came about in the 20s. It developed, it came to India with Kabuzier, actually not with Kabuzier, with Kalminde first uh, in 1948 to 49. Then uh, Kabuzier came and Louis Khan came and then, you know, Toshi, Korea, Kalminde, and there were so many other people, architects who, who were uh, strong believers of modern movement. 
my wife and I had lots of questions when we were studying and when we were graduating. And they dealt with why was there a disconnect between modern and traditional? Why? Because while I was studying, modern architecture was the menu of the decay. It was literally being pushed down our throats because everybody was a believer around us. Louis Kahn was coming to give us talks because he came for the site visits at the and a lot of what he talked about for a second year and third year architecture student like me actually went above my head. I did not understand because it was very high fund. Contrasting with that, Mr. Doshi was so down to earth that he, if he came from fourth year jury to second year jury, his vocabulary will change and his sentence construction will change and it would communicate <coughs> very well the ideas that he was talking about. We felt that not everything was right about modern architecture and modern movement. Because it stood out and disconnected itself with what was a development in this country for thousands of years. And people were still living in settlements which were three centuries old, four centuries old, five centuries old. I'm sure you're familiar with that in Spain as well. That there are settlements which are very old. We started questioning. So when we started our practice, we did not know which direction our practice should take. But we were very clear which direction our practice will not take. Modern architecture. That practice we will not pursue and we had three reasons for it. The first was that the basic belief, as we understood later on, in modern architecture was that because the production and industrialization was the, the future of the world, the processes are going to be industrialized and they will be applicable universally. And because the processes will be applied universally, the products can also be universal. And that somehow did not go down our throats. We felt that the strength of this country was in its variety. The richness of this country was in its diversity. Because we have five, I would say six different climatic zones in this country, we are very fortunate. We have the hot dry, the hot humid, the composite, the temperate, the cold dry and cold humid. Each of these climate produced over centuries climate responsive architecture using local materials, technologies and processes that were evolved through understanding of those materials. If we universalize the language of architecture, we would not be playing a supportive role to what constituted the strength of this country, but we would be playing a detrimental role. So he said, we will not do that. The third reason was that we wanted to bridge the gap between what we were and what we aspired to be without being a disconnect. So, now, we were at a dilemma. How do we decide what projects to take and how do we design? So we wrote down four convictions and <coughs> beliefs at the start of our practice. They were that all our projects will attempt conservation. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, no. At the end? No. Okay. So I speak a little louder. Can I get some water? Yeah. I speak a little louder. Okay. Oh, how much have we missed? Last few minutes or total? No, okay. Okay. So I, I, I'll go back last few minutes. We, we arrived in India knowing fully well which direction of practice we will not pursue. But we did not know which direction of practice we will pursue. That remained, uh, uh, how do I put a question mark. But we still had to practice 
we'll start, still have to take jobs, decide whether we accept this job or not accept, <coughs> clarify ourselves to the clients, the potential clients. So we decided we will write things down that will convince or convey to our potential clients what we will and what we will not do. So it was, it sort of took, uh, it manifested into four convictions and two beliefs. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Four beliefs and two convictions. Four convictions and two beliefs. The first conviction was that all our projects must attempt conservation of resources. And resources did not mean only money. It meant <coughs> land, the water that falls on the land, the uh, the, uh, the minerals, the flora, <coughs> the fauna, the materials that we have, <coughs> our rainfalls, our land terrain, and of course, the uh, conservation of energies, whether it's electrical, mechanical, or human, and also the people as a resource. Money, of course, will always be uh, uh, a resource. The second was that all our <coughs> projects will attempt a continuity of Indian traditions in its spaces, forms, and technologies. Now, the reason we chose the word Indian traditions is that the word Indian is a very ambiguous word. If you ask me what is Indian, I would not be clear. We have really graduated from being traditional Indian to contemporary Indian, retaining a lot of our Indian traditions and imbibing a lot more of the influence of the uh, global exposure. Some of them are good, some of them are not so good, some of the traditions are still relevant, the others are not relevant in today's time. But the continuity of Indian tradition was a safe bet. The third was that innovation is a necessity for a developing society and not a luxury as we were told when we were your age. We were told that India was a poor country, we did not have money for research, therefore we should utilize people who have already researched on various aspects and I think that has been the beginning of a lot of downfalls in India because those researches were not done for our country, our needs and for our resources. They were done for somebody else's resource and somebody else's agenda for their own countries and their probably global vision. The fourth was, and this came from visiting many award-winning <coughs> famous architectural buildings. We went to uh, to visit those buildings as students and later on as fresh architects and if we told the users that we are architecture students or architects then for first 15 minutes we had to listen to their complaints. They may have been the award winning projects, they may have been the most published projects, they may have been seen by all of us as iconic projects but they did not work as they were meant to entirely. And this included IIM and Dava. This included uh, Sanskar Kendra, the Kutusia building here. It included so many other buildings of famous architects. So we felt that because architecture is a service-oriented profession, we are not artists or sculptors. We have a responsibility to the end users. And those end users who are going to perform or spend the rest of their life maybe in that building, they need to be looked after. So if they were not looked after, we felt that was irresponsible architecture. And we needed responsible architecture while a society is being developed. So we said that responsible architecture can only come if we contextualize the design in all respects and if we do not 
put in the forefront the trend and fashion, but the context instead, and then design, keeping in mind the emerging aspirations, the new technologies, and so on and so forth, but not being without responsible to the context. The two beliefs were that every problem, irrespective of its nature, scale, complexities, or constraints, has an appropriate solution. And that appropriate solution will come if we define the problem correctly, choose the right tools, and apply them judiciously. Now with this in our back, those are the only assets we had in our back. We had not come back with much money uh, to, to establish ourselves, and we started our office. In 1987, which was eight years after we started our office, 15 years after I graduated, and 22 years after I joined architecture, we found the direction of our practice. This was in 1987. And we were chanced upon an assignment to make policies for conservation of Udaipur city. Have you been to Udaipur? Yes. Have you heard of it? Yes. Are you likely to go to? Yes. Oh, that would be good. So we chanced upon this, and I had gone there to do some measure drawings in 1969. Thereafter, we had not really gone to Udaipur. And in 87, we got this assignment because INTAC, are you familiar with INTAC, Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage? It's the body that was established in 84 to look after India's cultural heritage. <coughs> And this was their pilot project for a settlement. Till then, they were taking on projects of buildings and building complexes. But this was a settlement. And Udaipur was a very small settlement, about 300,000 people then in 1987, about 40,000 people in 1930s, 300,000 people in 1987. And today, they are about 700,000 people. This is the growth of Udaipur. Essentially tourist uh, destination. The most famous building there, apart from the city palace, was the Lake Palace Hotel. That was one of the first hotels in the middle of the lake. Now, at that time, we had not done any course in conservation. We had not even attended a lecture on conservation when we were given this assignment. And we told the people who gave us this assignment that this is the, the case. But we have some sense and sensibility or sensitivity towards what is history and how it made a little more sense in our lives. So they said, go ahead, do it. Now with this disadvantage, we decided that there is no point in reading about conservation at all. If we have the disadvantage, let us leave it at this, that disadvantage. and. We will walk. So we didn't read anything. We went to Udaipur every two to three weeks, six of us, and walked for three to four days within the world city with one agenda. What constitutes the strength of this city and what constitutes the weakness of the city? We felt that if we strengthen the strengths and overcome the weakness, then we will be halfway through to conservation. And that was the belief with which we started this journey. And that's what I'm sharing this with you. I gave you this preamble long one because you had to understand where we came from. So we went and we said conservation, and we had heard the word preservation. And we did not know the difference between the two because a lot of people were using those words for either meaning. So we looked at dictionaries, we did not still satisfy ourselves. So we evolved our own working definition which is still working for us. And the preservation to us was the process of prolonging the life of an object, a building, be it a sculpture, a textile, or whatever, that you preserve it. Whereas conservation was the process of bringing back to life an object, an area, a tradition. Forests are conserved. If you talk about forests, there's less times the people use the word preserved, but they are conserved because they continue to grow with the time. 
Then our next question was why conserve? Just because we were given the assignment, we need to conserve. We have to find the reason for why we need to conserve our cultural heritage. We thought that it was a major link with the past and showed the process of the development of a society. It represented a record of most of our cultural or historical attempts, achievements, as well as failures. It was so deeply rooted in our lives that whether we were aware of it or not, it determined the conduct of our lives. It provided us with the basis and motivation for future development. And whether we accepted it or not, it was interwoven with our lives so much that it gave us a sense of belonging. And this we don't generally ex accept, but if I go from here to US, I find that myself to be an alien. If I go from here to Tamil Nadu, I find myself to be an alien. And that's when I realize that I belong to Gujarat. And that if I stay in Tamil Nadu for 25 years, maybe I will begin to belong to Tamil Nadu. But right now, I belong to Gujarat. So this is the answer why. We then went on to what to answer. Now this is because I will leave this behind, uh, or I will email it to you in, in this, in the written form, because this is a, how do I put, the nichor, you know, the squeezing essence. of essence of all our life, okay, and uh, practice. Uh, see, if we make mistakes today, people would have made mistakes 400 years ago, 300 years ago. But just because a mistake has survived 300 years, does it mean that it warrants conservation? I'm not sure, we were not sure. So we said, what do we conserve? We realized that every city looked different. Whether it's Udaipur, Jaipur, Jodhpur, or even cities which are 100 kilometers from Udaipur were different settlements. That's because it had what we would we began to call the heritage fabric of that settlement. There were elements of man-made heritage. They were rooted in the elements of natural heritage. If the stone was the local material, the buildings were built of stone, which made the built heritage part of it or the man-made heritage part of it. And together, they were interrelated and interdependent and formed a fabric-like arrangement. And that was that if you allow one little portion of a fabric to deteriorate, you will find what happens to the rest of the fabric in no time. So if you allow some elements of man-made heritage or natural heritage to deteriorate, it would affect so many other elements as such. And the idea, what is this now? What to conserve? Yeah. So heritage fabric of a settlement gave it its distinct identity and made Ahmedabad different from Baroda or different from Anand, where all they have gone to. Ahmedabad and the Patan Modena. Patan Modena. Yeah, Patan, yes, Sitpur. Completely different from what cities of Ahmedabad. The identification of the heritage fabric helped us prioritize what to conserve first. Then we said how to conserve. No. Well, these are elements of heritage fabric, landforms, water, mountains, wildlife, minerals, squares, street facade, temples, mosques, avelis, lake, lake fronts, water uh, reservoirs, bowdies, what we call, even ruins, festivals, music, stone crafts, plastering techniques. People can be motivated to participate in conservation-oriented action, which is that it has potential to become a conservation movement. Now, this is what was our understanding at the end of about one year, 87 to 88, on what constitutes this. Then it gets expanded. What are our resources? An attitude to conserve, support from government and community organization, finance, locally available skills and voluntary time of motivated local residents. 
which you see in Ahmedabad now. There are a lot of local residents who are participating in the movement for conservation of water city. The bottom line was that until we re-establish the relevance of our cultural heritage in our lives, and unless conservation-oriented actions make a positive economic difference in the long term, the threat posed by our present life, lifestyle to a rich uh, inheritance, or a, if, no, there's something wrong here. here. Unless it makes a positive economic sense, this rich heritage will determine, deteriorate and disappear. Not very fast, but it still disappear. So, it required a major shift in our outlook and attitude. We felt that the present decision-making processes have rarely been based on understanding of history and heritage which establishes its relevance in our lives as well as in the practice of the profession. It did not make us aware of our responsibility and to make that balance. If the professionals were aware, we would not see in any of our developments and settlements a sudden lack of congruence. Now these are the other words that came into our life. Congruence and harmony. And then it was followed by sensitivity. These are words which are not architectural necessarily but they represent basics about how we feel comfortable in our life. <coughs> Sudden change is not a desirable change. Harmony, even in human beings, is a very desirable uh, necessity. So, we felt that we should make up for the lost time and we began a beginning with some inferences again, we felt that most of the buildings, traditional buildings, were very respectful of their surroundings, which is what this studio is about. How do you respect your surroundings when you come up with your inputs? Common sense was the common denominator in most decision-making processes. The traditional craft persons and construction workers were the principal carriers for centuries of knowledge and resultant skills required to use traditional materials and technologies. These are not available in most educational institutions today. And traditional craft persons are still available today, though one has to hunt for them, but there are not enough designers and architects who ask for their skills. Now let me explain the second last point of it. 97-98% of India has been built using mud, brick, stone, wood, lime, bamboo, grass and reed, and metals. There are 350 to 400 schools of architecture in this country. Then not more than 10% or even less maybe, are focusing on how these materials were used in India. Because our textbooks come from England. And I'll give you an example that all of us know in India how to design a door which has a top rail, a lock rail, and a bottom rail. And if we go to any of our villages, any village, you won't find such a door. They are not hinged, they are pivoted and we did not know about it. I was not aware of it till 10 years after I started our practice. And this is what made us go back <coughs> to understand how our materials were used in our own backyard and how do we continue with this. Present research activities rarely cover this knowledge. The understanding of traditional materials amongst us, the present professionals, tended to be more superfluous and concentrated more on the visual aspects rather than <coughs> the construction aspects. Most of us were inadequately equipped to deliver a responsible design in a historic context. Okay? And unless we re-educated and relearned, this was not going to be possible. Traditional design 
and construction processes offer opportunities for creative input at all levels of implementation. Creativity was not restricted to the design studio of architects. Simple looking time tested solutions make better built environment in the long run as compared to the variety oriented experiments without innovative and responsible approaches. Now this is a difficult one, uh, the second one, this uh, the last one. Responsible architecture, I told you, will evolve by contextualizing. A reflection of the designer's personality appears to be the principal objectives of many projects rather than the purpose for which it is built and the person or the organization which built it. So it made us understand that the strength of architecture of India lies in the anonymity of its architects or designers. Because we know every single building that Professor Doshi has done, or Charles Korea has done, or in your country uh, the architects have done, and most of our students know what is Zaha is doing, and what is Michael Graves' uh, architecture all about, or uh, Frank Gehry is all about, but we don't know who designed Taj Mahal, or Humayun Stone, or Red Fort, or Fatehpur Sikri, or Arti Singh Temple here, or any of the buildings, and they are no less great pieces of architecture than any of the pieces that we are seeing. So we felt, and I'm sure if you've seen Yatin Bhai's projects, it does not represent his personality, ever. Is there a project that represents your personality? It represents what he believes in. Our projects represent what we believe. It does not represent a style or a, 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 a particular, uh, how do you say, punchline. Mm -hmm. That a punchline that that is uh, uh, architects on pedestal. <coughs> now the writing part is more or less over, <laughs> so you can wake up. Uh, this is Amir, and Amir. Is, is outside, uh, can you see? Can we switch off the light behind? Little better? Focus. After Udaipur, we were involved in the conservation of Amer town. Amer town is probably more than 800 year old town, which is still inhabited. People live there. It's 11 kilometers outside Jaipur city. Jaipur city was designed and built in 1727, initiated. So Jaipur city itself is now close to 300 years old. Uh, Amer was 500 years beyond it and we started with that, we didn't have a map so we sort of evolved a map of our, oh I can't even use this, this is meaningless, anyway, so this is, that's the Jaigar Fort, that's a fortification of Amer, the larger fortification goes somewhere else and we were concentrating on the town and not on Jaipur first because it was the cradle of Jaipur city. We were given, we started, there was nobody to pay us money. There was no money. In fact, gave us some money, very little, to do this mapping. And we were, so we had patrons. We had John and Faith Singh of Anoki, if you know the government people. They, they were the promoters for conservation of hand block printing, uh, textiles in Jaipur and they also put their weight behind the conservation of our cultural heritage. So we went located a particular ruin and went to the government to give it to us to start a building school for building conservation there. And uh, we prepared the measured drawings, we prepared the, the uh, 
the adaptive reuse drawing for schools, classrooms, whatever. And 15 days before we were to take over, we were told that some other department of the government had given to another organization which was a leprosy center to be used as a leprosy center in the tourism dominated uh, uh, city. And we couldn't do anything about it. So rather than being disappointed, we started looking for another ruin that Intact could buy and we could conserve. So we located uh, another ruin. But simultaneously, there were again no money. So we were touring Australia for their student conferences, presentations. So Parul spontaneously invited Australian students to come to India and once they land in India, we will take care of all their expenditures, provided they work on conservation of Amir for two, three to four weeks. So three Australians came, we put them with two Indian students, and then began our entire process of understanding Amir, documenting Amir, evolving policies for its conservation, evolving policies for make it a better, more livable environment, to make it a tourist hub, and again with no resources. So it went on from 92 to 91 to 95. So conservation process started in 88, but 88 to 95, there was an ongoing work which documented and proposed to government, and we did not measure on how many reports, we just measured on the inches of the height of those reports, you know. At the end of it, there were about eight inches uh, thickness of reports that we just passed on to government to do something about it. There's some good government IS officers who came in significant positions, they took it up. It took three steps further, then he got transferred, another one came, so the process continued till 2001 when there was a significant contribution to it. So these are all maps, proposals, location of religious buildings, etc., etc. And that is the map. And the ruin that we located was uh, there. This is the ruin that we located. There was a gate next to it. Right next to it is a gate. And that is the Royal Garden, <coughs> the lake, the Amir uh, Palace. That's the lake. That's the garden. And this was the main, there are two entries that take you first to the palace. Uh, up at the Amir Palace, and this one went through to the city. And this is the one that led here to two, uh, two large water reservoirs. This was a city which could stand two years of siege from anywhere because it had only two entrances. It had a whole range of mountains from where the water came, which could be cultivated, and part of it could be used for the so this is the ruin that a client purchased for 125,000 rupees. That was, I would think, about $4,000. Yeah, yes, $2,000. $4,000. No, 16, th 30 rupees at that time. At that time. And that time it was 30 rupees a dollar. So it was, and it was devaluated recently. So uh, it was uh, $4,000, euros never existed then, in 1989, 890. So this was the ruin that we took. And the client took this ruin and said, now Nimish Parul, what do we do next? Now the whole idea was to bring about a conservation movement by generating sense of pride amongst the people of Amir about their own historicity. So we said, let us take this opportunity to prove that this ruin is not as dilapidated as it appears to be. That it is, doesn't take as much time or as much cost as we think it does to bring it to a usable <coughs> level. That it does not need any industrialized and processed material uh, through industrialization processes to bring it back to life, and last, that it does not need 
any contemporarily trained architects or engineers to ensure that everything is done properly, including ourselves. Because if we were to do that, the sense of pride would be missing about their own potential and their own, own skills in this. So we said, let's look for traditional craft persons. It took our client three months to find the first master crafts person from a place called Samod. And he came, Premchand Mistri, came with four other craft persons. And then we said, what do we do next? He said, okay, these people have built buildings without any drawings. Drawings came to us only after the Britishers came to us. We never built buildings with drawings. We built buildings with something else. We, they could be drawn on stone, little sketches. They would say, divide this space in 29 uh, divisions or seven divisions or eight divisions or whatever. So we said, we will not make any drawings. Let's see what happens. And that's how the process began. Since we were not to be party to decision making, we had to remain in the background. John Singh, this is John Singh. This is a poor this slide converted into, but this is John Singh. No, that's John Singh, sorry. That's John Singh. And this is Prenjan Mistri, the master craft person. Fortunately, it's no more. And this is the ruin within which the first detail, first meeting take, took place. <coughs> the, this we did much later. This was done after the conservation was completed. You had uh, an entrance, you had one vestibule, you had a veranda, a courtyard, and up to here. This did not exist. This we found because we found this wall to have space behind while we were conserving. So we opened up to find another space inside, but it did not have the wall. So we built the wall. And it later on told us how wrong we were in thinking of it as a space. Okay. So that was the ground floor plan. There was a staircase. This is a later staircase. This is not the original, sorry. There was a staircase. This staircase was original. That was original. This was added. So once you came up, that was the hall in which you saw that old photograph of the meeting. The courtyard, the back. This was a space that, that opened up on the upper level, a further space. And the still upper level and the terrace. So the section was, the original drawing that we had was up to here. And then we opened this up and went as the hill went up. Actually, that was the passage for the water that came from the hill to go by the side of the building and out. And the minute we did this wall, the water began to come through the walls. So we had to open up further, build yet another wall, and divert the water at a later date. And we made this mistake because we came from the contemporary times of wanting to use every space that we that was available to us, whereas in tradition people had left that space to do the right thing and to make sure the water never bothered for 300 years. This was one of the corridors. That's the slab. In Rajasthan, <coughs> you have stone slabs. There are no uh, there are thick stones available. Now we do it with about 75 millimeter slabs, 55 millimeter slabs also. But this seems to be 150 millimeter. This was while the conservation was going on. This was when it was more or less completed. So what did we tell them? We told them, don't let this building fall down any further. That's what our instructions, because we, had no, we did not make any drawings. So don't allow this building to deteriorate further. Whatever is weak, remove it. So we lost this Jaroka. That Jaroka we lost, that's the balcony we lost. And we want to see as much stone as possible use as much of material that's lying around. We don't want to get newer material to restore this or conserve this. And then they came down to, you can see this opening. So then they said, how do we do openings? And again, we said, we don't know because there are 350 ruins all around you. Go look for those ruins. See what space to what space has what kind of lintel. 
We told them the sill has to be horizontal, jams have to be vertical. We don't know whether the lintel is curved, arched or whatever, but you look at it because we would be doing the same thing again. This was more a process of getting that sense of pride going to the uh, uh, people. And the craft persons began to work to begin with five and then five became a little more so that's the before and after using the same material without using any cement cement was only used in the toilets uh, tiling and whatnot because we had to make it usable after the first year of the australian studies because we had about five years of australian groups coming here we began to live in the ruin itself we had some got some toilets made so that the entire process was part of the 24-hour uh, cycle. That's the before and after. That's the wall we broke. That's the wall we thought was not the end of it. And we broke and made some more rooms. And those rooms, uh, well, that's, we'll see some better slides, but yeah. That's the entrance, looking towards the entrance. Now, that was the state. And now, when we look back, or when our clients look back, then we wonder, what made us think that this was even restorable? <coughs> now, because the first thing would be, it's dilapidated, it's not stable, it's not uh, structurally sound, etc., etc. We must have been mad to do whatever we did, all of us, five of us. That was during restoration, and this is after. That's the team. That's Pension Mystery. This gentleman is a project manager. He had just graduated, and he was going with the group that Parul was taking around to measure things. So Parul asked him if he wanted to get employed in looking after the conservation project, and he became a project manager there. He's still working for the same organization now. He has his own textile, little textile unit that uh, uh, supplies to the main unit. And then we found some very interesting things. You must have seen this bracket, even in Ahmedabad on the balcony, which is a five-way bracket. You know, it has four and a fifth one because it's in the corner, <coughs> any corner. Now, that bracket is constructed, made out of three pieces, upside down, like that. It is assembled upside down, and then it is reversed, and then you can lift three pieces with two hands. That's the interlocking. It will never separate itself once you put the lime and other material in it, and that's the final bracket. This is a model we got made to explain to people. See. Later on, we did a hotel in Udaipur called the Obrai Uday Vilas. In the last five minutes, we are showing you what, uh, what our continuity means, you know, in a historic uh, area. And the architect of that said that, please give me the drawing of such brackets. I said, we don't know how to make the drawings of these brackets. I got the model made. And in a meeting, I took the model, I showed them how they were, uh, turned upside down, lifted it, and I said, all we have to do is to tell the craft person, this is the height I need, that's the width I need, that's the overhang I want to support, give us a bracket. And that's all that they do. They don't need drawings. So at the end of an hour and a half meeting, after demonstrating this, the architect asked me, so when are you giving me drawings? <laughs> I have no words to explain how close we are in understanding. So that's the ruin, and that's what it became. Now between this and that, not a bag of cement, no construction drawings, some flooring drawings, which we, I was not able to go there for five months, and another architect from Delhi was involved, he gave some flooring drawings, but no construction drawings. 
the cost was ten dollars a square foot, which was about hundred dollars a square meter in those days. That was eighty eighty euros. No, eighty euros. Yes. Yeah. yeah? Yes. About eighty euros a square meter. New buildings were costing at that time seventy percent higher than this cost. <coughs> And so we ended up proving that our ruins were valuable. What did it do? 350 ruins, 350 houses in Amir. People who wanted to make new houses used ruins as a source of building material. They didn't have to purchase anything. They would just go pick up the stones, but and there were no takers for the ruins, no owners, we went land record, nothing. When this project came halfway through, and this was purchased for 125,000 rupees, a little larger, twice the size ruin, a cross started being quoted at 43, 4 point, no, 4 crores is 40 million? Yeah, yeah 4 crores, 40 million rupees. Every ruin found three owners. This was the impact, you know, of, of the value of what a ruin could become if you invest in it. And that's the, well, that's the, that's the, what we discovered, you know, and the water started leaking. We're still using it because we found the way to restore it. That's some of the, that's the corner bracket. Stonework. This cluster is made out of lime, which has to be treated for 12 to 15 months before you can use it. This is a stucco, as I think Italians call it stucco. But you, you continue to change the water. I still don't know how it's made. I, it's not easy to, uh, to do this. I tried to, there are stories that I'll tell you later on, about how the lime was made and how they did not share with us how this was being made, uh, till we stopped asking. Uh, this was, you have to take an earthen pot, they took an earthen pot, filled it with very good quality, well uh, pulverized grounded lime, put it in water below the ground, change the water every two days for a year, until the lime reached its level that was ready to be used. 12 or 15 months. And then they mixed it with jaggery, fenugreek, eggshells, and so on and so forth to do this plaster. This plaster, this photograph was taken last January, not this January, 2014 January. So that would have been about 25 years later. And the specification for this plaster, according to them, was 